Hi everyone, this is Nick. Welcome to Duality Repair, and this is an NAD 1155 preamp. I've worked on one other 1155 in the past, but honestly I don't even remember what the problem with that one was. I don't think it's the same as this one though. The complaint from this one is that we get no output no matter what input is used, and I actually was not able to reproduce the problem until recently, so let me turn it up. I have a one kilohertz sine wave at the input of each channel, and you can see we do get an output, but only from one channel. And I believe I've actually already figured out the problem. So if we take a look at this listen switch, which is basically just an input selection switch, if I toggle that just a little bit, you can see we are able to get the output from the other channel. So this should be a fairly straightforward repair if we can get this switch out of the unit, if we can get it open and service it. So let's see if we can do that. Here's the switch in question, the input selection switch. Now the only way to clean this properly is to remove it from the unit disassemble it. Hopefully that's possible. And to be clear, all of the switches and buttons and potentiometers in this unit are of the same age and so they're susceptible to the same problems that this switch is. So we will be pulling and cleaning those as well. But I do want to start with this to make sure that we can get a, a reliable, stable output from each channel. So to remove it, there are a bunch of pins to desolder on the switch itself on the back of the board. Looks like I'll also have to desolder and remove this cable, this cable, and maybe even this one. I'm hopeful there's enough play in this coupler here so that I don't need to remove this rod and then the knob on the front of the unit, but we'll see. So let's start desoldering. Here's the switch, and you can see all of the electrical contacts in the center. It's actually got two unpopulated contacts. It's interesting. And then a post in either corner. First thing I want to do though is remove the two cables. And so I marked each set. So here's the first set of three, marked it there. The other set of three, so that's one cable. And then here's the set of four, and then this one's hard to see on camera, but the set of four there. So I'm gonna start with those. Some equipment is just an absolute dream to work on compared to others when it comes to removing components. Take a look at how easily this solder wicks up. It's rarely that easy. I had to go with the larger braid to get these larger four corner posts. Should be all of it. Let's see if we can get the switch out. All right, the switch is removed from the board, but let's see if we can get it decoupled here from this coupler. Yep, there we go. It's a lot of pins. Let's see if we can get it open. All right, so to get this apart, I think we have to pull back these three tabs and the matching three tabs on this side. Just kind of pull them back so that they're parallel with this face here. And then might also need to remove this C-clip that's mounting the shaft to the switch. I'm not sure. Hopefully that's it. I'm not sure if there's anything else tying this together, but we'll start with that. This is an interesting switch. Let's take a look at it now that it's deconstructed. So we'll start with this. I'm gonna call this the housing. And so we have our post here. This goes all the way out to the front of the unit. This is what you're rotating when you're selecting your input and it's attached to this plastic piece here via a gear. And as you rotate the knob, the plastic piece inside slides back and forth within the housing. The plastic piece has four notches to hold these four sliders, I'm gonna call them. So these little sliders slide along the rail back and forth as you adjust the input selection switch. The outer end here is electrically connected to this main post, which goes from end to end. And then the center pin goes to one of several contacts. And that's what allows you to change the input selection. So I think it's pretty obvious here, the failure mode is just too much grease. There's certain spots, I think, that the grease is impeding the electrical conductivity between the slider and the contact. So what I'll need to do is clean all of this grease off, reapply a little bit of new grease, and this should be good to go. All right, I used a little bit of deoxid D100L and some isopropyl alcohol to clean it up. 
and then I added just a little bit of super lube and I think it looks really nice should work just fine now so let's get it reinstalled and test All right, the switch is reinstalled. Let's take a look at the results. I have a one kilohertz, 100 millivolt sine wave at each input for the CD video input. Let's take a look. You can see we have both outputs now and they're both very clean. And even if I mess with this input selection switch, toggling it back and forth, there's no marginality there at all on the output. I've tested all five inputs and they're all working just the same. So I'd say cleaning that switch definitely resolved this issue fantastic. Although the main complaint with this unit has been resolved, while I have this unit I want to do as much as I can to future-proof it. And so the next thing I want to look at are these two transistors here. These are the series pass transistors and they're responsible for regulating the plus and minus 24 volts for the entire unit. You can see this area of the board is a lot darker than the rest of the board and that's because that's the power supply section. And so that means any component in this area and especially these two transistors have seen a lot of heat throughout their life. And it's probably shortened them to the point where they should be replaced. And so I'm going to replace these two transistors here. Here are the two transistors I'm gonna to use to replace the originals. It's an A1220A and a C2690A. The specifications for these transistors meet or exceed that of the originals. So these should work just fine. Let's take the old ones out. Pretty easy to see how dark the back of the board is as well. Not much thermal compound left on the original heatsink and transistor. I'll clean that heatsink and apply some new thermal compound. The new transistors are installed, but I'm just not happy with the way that they're mounted, in particular with the way that the heat sinks are mounted. Look at this. The heat sinks kind of just shift underneath, and it has to do with how the screws are mounted to the bottom of the board. So let's flip it over. Here are the heat sink screws popping through on the other side, and there's just nothing to hold these down properly, and so that's why the heat sinks are able to slide around. So I'm going to have to come up with something better than this. I used some new screws and self-locking nuts and I'm much more comfortable with how secure these transistors and heat sinks are mounted to the board. I turn the unit on and I'm looking at the collector of Q601 which is the positive 24 volt regulator and as you can see we're sitting at 23.9 volts. According to the service manual we should be somewhere between 23 and a half and 24 volts. So I'd say this is perfect. Let's move on. Up next are capacitors. With the unit being 30 or 40 years old and all of the electrolytics being original they all need to be replaced. So here's my list of capacitors for the unit. The ones in orange I have, the ones that are X'd out I needed to order. So here are the ones that I have in stock that I'm ready to replace today. All the rest are in order, they'll be here soon. There's really not too many that I need to talk about, maybe just the two in the power supply. So when we get there, we will talk about those. Let's get started.
All right, making some really good progress on the recap. I only have about 10 left. As I mentioned, I think there are only a few capacitors that are even worth talking about. It's these two here. These are the two filter capacitors for the power supply. So we have power from the transformer coming in here. It is rectified by the bridge rectifier, and then it comes into these two capacitors as plus and minus 32 volts. Now these capacitors are 1000 microfarad at 35 volts and 85 degrees C. Now while these do work, I would recommend going a little bit higher. There's not much margin between the 32 volts that it's filtering and the 35 volt rating. And so I'm going with these. These are Nichicon 1000 microfarad, same capacitance, but 50 volts, so much larger margin there, and 105 degrees C. So these are a definite upgrade. And fortunately, they are identical in size, both diameter and height, and even the lead spacing. So they're gonna fit in exactly as these do. Should work really well. The recap is complete. I think it turned out really, really well. Let's power it on, make sure our voltages are still good, and see if we can pass the signal. The power supply appears to be functioning. We're at 23.9 volts on the positive rail and negative 23.7 on the negative rail. All right, final test. I have a one kilohertz sine wave at the CD video input. I'll turn it up. And both channels look great. They look to be evenly matched. And if I turn on and off that switch, that listen switch, nice clean transitions, and even when I toggle it, it doesn't drop out at all. So that's pretty stable now. Let's increase the frequency and monitor the response. There's five kilohertz, still looks good. 10, 15, and 20. Looks good to me. So this preamp just needed a little bit of love and I think it's ready to run for many years to come. So thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.